Good afternoon. So we have a number of bills to get through today, and um, so we ask for your patience, and uh, we'll move on. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I am Sharon Green Middleton, Vice President of the City Council, representative for the 6th Council District, and chairperson of the Economic and Community Development Committee. This afternoon, we will hear the following bills. 23-0477, uh, Landmark List Exteriors, 3110 Elm Avenue. Also, Bill number 24-0504, Zoning Opening Space District, Conditional Use Cultural Facility, and Parking Lot Variances for uh, C.C. Jackson Park, and uh, of course, the wonderful library at 4910 Park Heights Avenue, and then Bill number 24-0514, Zoning Conditional Use Conversion, Single Family Dwelling Units to Two Dwelling Units in the R7 Zoning District Variances, 3040 Barclay Street, and then we're going to have a conversation about 230435 zoning code modifications and then 240486 zoning conditional use banquet hall variance 601 cherry hill road in attendance today we have members of the committee john bullock of the ninth district mark conway of the fourth district ryan dorsey of the third district Antonio Glover, 13th District, Odette Ramos, 14th District, Thank you, Madam Chair. and Robert Stokes, 12th District, and we have a complete quorum. And representatives of the Office of the President, I see Tiffany Macklin, Deputy Director for Legislation, and representative for the office of the mayor, Tyler Shinella, with government relations. So let's begin, and we're starting with bill number 230477, landmark list exteriors of 311 Elm Avenue for the purpose of designating 311 Elm Avenue, block 3504B, lot 006, as an historical landmark exterior. This bill was introduced on October 30 of 2023, and this bill was sponsored by Council Member Ramos. Comments from the sponsor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, this building uh, is in the lower part of the Hamden community. Uh, it has traditionally been, and we'll hear from CHAP in a minute, um, a uh, book bindery. You will note in your packet that we do have an amendment that actually names the building the book bindery so that it is official. Uh, and. Uh, the community has come together to make sure that this building is uh, preserved. There's a lot of demand for development in Hamden, which is a good thing, but we want to preserve uh, what has architecturally and historically been um, a great building. There is also an amazing 100-year-old chimney uh, where it has become the... Um, the I don't know what to call it because I'm not a birder, but they the the um, chimney swifts uh, come and uh, they go into the chimney uh, in the spring and in the fall, and it is a sight to see. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that that was also preserved. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I hope to have your favorable report. Thank you. We'll start with agency reports and uh, the City Solicitor's Office. Thank you, Madam Chair. Michelle Toth on behalf of the City Solicitor's Office, and we approve the bill for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you. Uh, CHAPS, that's the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Lauren Chizik, uh, Historic Preservation Planning Supervisor and Acting Executive Director until Monday. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, CHAP recommends approval. Uh, would, would you like 
me to say a few words about the history? Okay. Um, so, you know, this, this property is an excellent example of post-World War I industrial development in residential neighborhoods in Baltimore City. Um, and it represents industrial diversification in Hamden at the city at large when many industries in Hamden, the creation of Cotton Duck, uh, was becoming obsolete. And so Hamden reinvented itself from a 19th century industrial mill village to an industrial city neighborhood in the 20th century. And it also is an excellent example of the early 1920s, 1930s industrial architecture um, and, um, and engineering practices. So we recommend approval. Thank you. Housing and community development. Jason Wright, representing DHCD. We respectfully stand behind our favorable bill report. Thank you, Planning Commission. All right, uh, Lauren Chizik, also representing uh, Planning Commission, and Planning Commission also has a favorable um, recommendation. Thank you, the BMZA. Uh, Madam Chair, the BMZA as a quasi-judicial agency will not be providing comment on this bill. Thank you, Baltimore Development Corporation. Mike. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Dave Garza for the BDC. We stand by our report favorable to Council Bill 23-0447. Thank you. Thank you. Do committee members have any comments or questions before we go to public testimony? Hearing none, we'll begin with in-person testimony. If you're online and wish to testify, please use the raise hand button and we'll unmute you. But we do have some in-person people here first. So we'll start with Alice, Alice Nelson, Greeley Nelson. Please come up to the podium, turn on the mic for the red to show. That's the button on the, all right, okay. Um, I'm just here to support the bill. Speak, speak your name for Madam Oh, Alice Tracker. Greeley Nelson, and I live in Hamden, and I am here to support the bill. Um, I, I've lived in Hamden for 38 years now, and I've seen lots of changes in Hamden, but the bindery has been a stable place, and also I'm an avid bird watcher and have been watching the chimney that's attached to the bindery for many years and um, would hate to see it changed. And so that's all my comments. Thank you. The next person, um, Tang is the last name. And A-N-C-H-I-N-G. Anching, not, they're not, not here? You're not, you don't want to testify, okay. Um, Lambro Catry, <laughs> sorry if I mispronounced the name wrong. I'm going by the spelling. They, you live in, uh, on Cape May Rose? Oh, no testifying, okay. All the way down to Kathleen Littleton. Sorry about that. You signed in, but you know, go ahead. Good afternoon, um, Madam Middleton and- uh, State your name. Oh, my name's Kathleen Littleton. Um, and Vice Chair Bullock and members of the committee. Uh, my name's Kathleen Littleton and my husband and I own a home on the 800 block of West 32nd Street, adjacent to the property on 3110 Elm Avenue. I'm a nurse. And I also organize a group of neighbors called the South Hamden Neighbors. Um, we're a group of roughly 200 Hamden residents who live near the building we lovingly call the Book Bindery. And I come before you today seeking your support of this bill, 23-0447. So the building has a rich history in our neighborhood. It directly links the history of manufacturing and production with home life in Hamden. And the history of the building, along with its architectural and social merits, were wonderfully depicted uh, by Chap. So as a nurse and not as an architect or historian, I allow that report to stand on its own, but I can speak to the benefit of the building to the community and why it should be preserved as a historical landmark. 
The book bindery is a piece of living history in our neighborhood. Um, its mere presence celebrates Baltimore's vast contributions to industry. And even though it no longer prints phone books or city documents, it draws residents from all over Baltimore to admire its beloved chimney, uh, which is the temporary home to a federally protected species of chimney swifts as they seek a safe haven along their migratory path each spring and fall. So for a century, the row homes of 32nd Street have nestled against the brick facade of the book bindery, and they've been great neighbors to one another. The new Crindon homes um, on West 32nd Street were modeled after features of the book bindery. And when the Southampton Neighbors Group first learned of the possibility of developing the book bindery building, we were alarmed by the proposed scope and scale of the project and concerned that developers could so easily change the architectural and historical fabric of our neighborhood without much regulation. So under the guidance of Councilperson Ramos, whose support we greatly appreciate, we sought to take action against defacing or demolishing the building by protecting it and honoring its historical contribution to the neighborhood and the city. So please vote in favor of the bill, 23-0447. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, now we're checking online to see if there's anyone online wishing to testify. Please use your raise hand button and we will unmute you if, you, if you're on. And we see no green buttons, so thank you. Okay, so um, we have two things to vote on. I hear that CHAPS is recommending a change in, change in the title. Is there, um, do I have a um, motion to move that? We have a formal amendment in the packet for the, bound, the changes. Okay. So everybody should have gotten that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do I hear a motion to vote on the amendment for the change in so the- So moved. So moved. So moved by Ramos and second by Glover. All in favor? Aye. Um, do I have to run down each person for the amendment? Not for an amendment, not for an amendment. Not for an amendment. No? Okay. Is that a no, right? Just making sure. Okay. Okay, is there a motion to move the bill favorable as amended? So moved. So moved by Ramos, second by Conway. Conway. Chair Middleton, yes. Bullock? Yes. Is a yes. Conway? Yes. Is a yes. Dorsey? Yes. Is a yes. Glover? Yes. Is a yes. Ramos? Yes. Is a yes. And Stokes? Yes. Is a yes. That will be moved to second reader at the next council meeting. Now we're with bill number 24-0504. And again, that's the zoning, open space district, conditional use, cultural facility, and parking lot variances for C.C. Jackson Park and Library. 4910 Park Heights Avenue. For the purpose of permitting, subject to certain conditions, the establishment, maintenance, and operation of a cultural facility and a, an open off-street parking area on the property known as C.C. Jackson Park and Library, 4910 Park Heights Avenue, block 4605, lots 001-018-021, and also uh, 055-065 as outlined in red on the accompanying plats and providing for a special effective date. This bill was introduced on April 8th, 2024 and sponsored by um, Vice President Middleton. And I just uh, wanna just quickly say that, you know, we have been in the, uh, myself has been working with the Park Heights community Rec and parks, housing, just um, for a very long time, really trying to get the space for the library, the first the new library in 17 years in our entire city, really moving for this community. And, um, you know, we need this extra space for not just the building of the library, but for the, um, entire project that has been going on on that campus of C.C. Jackson for many years. You know that we have a wonderful um, uh, space there 
that was built uh, for um, with the Cal Ripken Foundation and the Ravens Foundation for the field. Um, the actual rec center did a massive renovation. They're working on the pool. That whole campus has continues to be and will be the center of attraction for many needs of uh, the Park Heights community and just really uh, thankful that this process have, has went through the Commission of Planning with approval and so on and just wanting this to continue to move on so we can make ground for um, something that um, the over 30,000 people in that area are just waiting patiently for. So this is one big step that will get us to that. And with that being said, we'll start with the city solicitor's office. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Elena DePietro from the Baltimore City Law Department. The Law Department approves the bill for form and legal sufficiency subject to the finding of facts um, to be presented during the testimony today because there were the planning department's uh, report does not contain the facts. So the planning department can provide them through testimony. Okay. All right. And we'll go ahead and move to the planning department. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Eric Tiso for the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission heard this bill at their meeting of May 9th. Uh, this is uh, both a uh, conditional use and incorporates a variance into it. And the reason for the variance is that we have a general provision in the zoning code that whatever the required parking is, double that number is the maximum. So the required parking would have been five, double that is 10. Clearly that's not reasonable uh, for the size of demand. Uh, what makes this particular use unique is it is not just a parking lot for the library, it's for the entirety of the park parcel and it's used mm -hmm. as overflow parking. So really it serves more than that. Um, so an argument could probably be made that it serves multiple uses on site, but uh, for a uh, better part of caution, uh, the variance uh, pieces uh, included. Um, in the, the presentation of the Planning Commission, uh, they looked at the, the various conditional use uh, findings maybe were a bit uh, terse in our report, but we didn't see uh, where any uh, conditions created by this parking lot would be more impactful in this particular location than anywhere else. Uh, it meets all the development standards. I reviewed it through site plan review committee and found it uh, to meet all the design standards required for parking lots. And we couldn't find any uh, negative things that would come out of it. And so for that reason, the planning commission uh, recommended favorable and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for reiterating uh, how this is really like a, a campus and a centerpiece for um, just about everything that's going to um, help that community uh, proceed, especially the new 17 acres that's starting to develop as well. So appreciate that. Any, quest any other questions on from this point? Moving on. Sorry about that. Okay, housing. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Jason Wright representing the Department of Housing and Community Development. We respectfully stand behind our favorable bill report. Thank you. BMZA, BMZA, Tyler. Uh, the BMZA is a quasi judicial agency, will not be submitting a report. Thank you. Baltimore Development Corporation. Madam Chair, Dave Garza for BDC. We stand by our report favorable. Thank you. Thank you. Department of Transportation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Luciana Diaz with DOT. We stand with our bill report of no objection. Thank you, Park and Authority. Oh, sorry. Office of Equity and Civil Rights. Good afternoon, Chair Green Middleton, Vice Chair Bullock, and members of the committee. My name is Zachary Wellman, Equity Policy Analyst and Legislative Liaison for the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. The Office of Equity and Civil Rights stands by its report and support of the bill, provided that the prescribed accessibility features are present within the parking lot as outlined by the report. Thank you. Thank you. Department of Public Works. Good 
the Department of Public Works stand by that bill report. Thank you, and uh, Recreation and Parks. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. This is Jenny Morgan from Baltimore City Rec and Parks. I have with me Kate Brower from the Capitol Division, Megan McCorkle from the Pratt Library. Kate has a brief presentation she'd like to make before the committee, if okay with you. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's on. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just show a few visuals so people get a sense if they're not familiar with what the site looks like. Show it. Sorry, it's not. Okay. Okay. Would you mind changing? Uh, this is the site location. It's uh, Park Heights and Woodland Avenue. Um, there are two major redevelopment projects going on now, currently under construction as well as in future development. Uh, senior housing, which is across Park Heights Avenue as well as a multifamily project, as well as right across Woodland Avenue are uh, single family townhomes and multifamily. Next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. And these are just uh, close-ups of the housing that's being developed across Park Heights and across Woodland Avenue. Next. This is the site as it is currently. As you can see, uh, Chair Middleman said uh, that the new field was developed some years ago, and there's a rec center as well um, that had an addition. We are now on the park expansion piece, and the portion outlined in yellow is the expansion. Um, where you see the library in the parking lot, that will be the new library with the parking lot. Next, please. Another view of the same site. Next, please. Okay, and um, this is over 10 years. Um, there have been plans to redevelop this whole area to create a more vibrant Park Heights neighborhood. So this uh, expansion of the park was actually identified over 10 years ago to provide recreation for this area. Next, please. Uh, we had a massive um, uh, master planning vision uh, for the park, which involved a lot of community participation. Um, and there you see the, the schedule, but you should have that in your packet. Next, please. We had several public meetings. Um, we also met with the PCDA, open house, block parties, and a survey to uh, gather feedback from the local community as to what they would like to see in the park. And the library was part of the planning process. And everybody was very supportive of having the library there. Next, please. Next, please. This is the revised plan that we are working towards. The plans are uh, close to 100% complete. Um, we um, anticipate advertising sometime in the fall. Next, please. Next, please. Um, close up. Next, please. And these are some views of the library. Next, please. Next, please. And perspectives of what you're going to see. Next. And next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Next. Um, just to give you a sense of the anticipated schedule, um, we are working on the 100% construction plans both for the park and the library, which should be completed probably by the end of the month, early August. Uh, we will be going for building permit, bid, bid package, August, September, and we in, um, anticipate starting construction in February of next year. Um, just wanted to reiterate basically what Eric said, um, that we are looking to have a parking lot of 47 spaces because the permitted spaces of 10 is insufficient to support the library and increased park programming. Next, please. And uh, so there are 47 spaces that are proposed that would be shared by the library and the park patrons. It's consistent with the staff um, and patrons at similar libraries across the city. Um, it will be, pro um, it's a, will be used for overflow parking during off hours and weekends. There will also be a pavilion rental. The lot will be closed for um, 
daily after um, the library hours or if there are no um, park uses. There will be park uh, lighting and there will be security cameras. I should also mention that there are, of the 47 spaces, four of them are allocated um, for um, patrons with ADA needs and two of them will have um, um, EV electric vehicle charging stations. There will also be nine bicycle racks that are adjacent to the parking lot and to the library. Next, please. So the, the request is before you. Next, please. Um, just showing you the maps of, you can see outlined in red, which are the lots, which would be, um, will, are consolidated as we're speaking um, and where the uh, library and parking lot will be located. Next, please and um, the Planning Commission um, supported this proposal. Thank you. Thank you for those details. Um, any questions from the committee? Hearing none. Just, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yes. Could you just go back to the last slide? Councilman Bula. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, thank you, Madam Chair. The, the slide with the, yes. No, we're just looking at the, the, the layout. Um, how many parking spaces? 47. 47, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Just curious, um, is any of these, are any of these parking spaces required by a parking minimum? minimum? Uh, for the library use, five would be the minimum, 10 would be the maximum, and so the variance included to go above that is included in the bill. Um, one thing that I'm not sure was done, if there were other uses throughout the entirety of the park that may need parking that's provided here, I don't think that analysis has been done, but the variance is included just in case. Uh, but as a practical need, being that it's serving more than just the library, uh, that's what Parks and Recs felt that they had to have here. You want to respond to the... Oh, yes. I mean, there will be a rental pavilion. Um, there is a practice field. Um, there are community events. The community spoke very um, enthusiastically about having community events. There will be grills there. Um, we have games, and I think the idea is to expand the active use of the park. And active use of the of that particular parking lot. There was a small parking lot when uh, designed when the actual rec center was completed. And uh, it's right next to the area to where, you know, the 17 acres is. And it's always been a parking problem, especially when they have big events on that field. And so they're just really, looking ahead that that whole area is going to be like a a hub for everything in that entire community um the library itself as you know our libraries have changed and they service the community in different ways and this library is going to do the same thing so um getting those spaces have been needed just because of all the new kinds of activity that's happening in that area, along with now the uh, buildings of, you know, apartments, there's going to be row homes, single family homes, um, that, it, that space is just needed. Um, Councilman Dorsey, I know your uh, hard work on limiting, but My, that, actually, that it, I just want to say that particular air, that this space is going to be utilized for other it actually, things. the point for me is mm -hmm. is that this goes well beyond any parking minimum requirement. And to just try to re-emphasize the point that parking minimum requirements in general are irrelevant because anytime anybody's developing anything, including the government itself, it does an assessment of what is adequate parking and then builds to suit what they believe their need is. That there's actually no need of actual parking minimum requirements. That they're stupid. Thanks. <laughs> Um, going through this, it kind of reminds me that sometimes we maybe we need to have conversations when we d build things like this that we don't just call it a parking lot. Maybe a new name needs to be um, originated to for proof. Um, 
It's much supported by the community, by the organization Park Heights Renaissance, also came and did uh, strong testimony on behalf of the community. And um, any other questions? Um, Councilman Stokes. Thank you. I just have a question for Rec and Parks. I know we want our young people to participate in our green space. And the only reason why I'm asking this is because in my district, we had young people that showed up they was drinking alcohol, they were smoking weed. I mean, are y'all going to have rules in the park to have some more control? Because that happened last summer in Rack and Park Snow. A couple of times we had to put city trucks there because it just got out of hand. They were sitting on people's cars. I mean, they was doing everything. Question is, are you gonna have rules to the park that control the space more? Because uh, I had a, a was event in my district and they fill out an application and they said they wasn't gonna have no alcohol. And they sit there and had a party, had alcohol in the park. We have to have some rules on city recreation space because if not, we are gonna still deal with, like pop-ups are fine, but sometimes they get out of hand. So we're wrecking parks be, I guess for that particular park, actually for all of them, where there be rules on the park that tell you what you have to do. If you want to use this park, you have to call this number, you have to file this application. To me, it makes more sense. So I would just say that um, for gatherings over 35 people, you need to have a permit, and there are rules that are required. We, have, we do have some more rangers that are part of the Rec and Park staff, so those folks can be deployed. We also will have security cameras in the parks, which will be monitored. No, I'm talking about actually have the rules there in the park. It can be on Oh, absolutely. Metal. Yes, we will have a sign because with the park rules. The only reason why I'm saying that, because I've said this before, and now you're building another new park, but there's no rules in the other park. So if you put it here, I think we should be looking at how we put them at all Rec and Parks property. So I can uh, add some answers to that, particularly for this area. Um, because Park Heights Renaissance is the lead for development in that whole area, um, it's one of the largest redevelopment areas in the state of Maryland, right next to the racetrack, they are in fact, um, working on a safety uh, group that's, that's going to be led by a team and that's going to start real soon and that's going to cover much of this area. Uh, before this area, we know that um, there are a number of places within Park Heights, particularly around this area that have been um, really uh, having problems with um, uh, drugs, alcohol, all kinds of um, illegal behavior and problems. And so um, they're going to be partnering and having their own uh, safety group to work this whole area. So um, that's one, another positive incentive that's going to be happening as this community is being revitalized. Still need the rules. <laughs> Councilman Stokes, I'm happy to address that. Most of our parks, if not all, have park rule signs posted. If you don't see the sign, please let me know and we'll make sure that it's installed. Okay. Um, I'll send you my list. Okay. I look forward to it. Any other questions on this um, particular bill? Hearing none, um, thank you. And thank you. I don't think we have any other in-person testimony. She didn't check all okay. I do see a Megan McCorkle signed up. Do you want to testify? Uh, Megan McCorkle on behalf of the Pratt Library. Uh, first of all, Chair Middleton, thank you so much for your support of this project over the past decade. Um, 
We obviously support this bill. The parking lot is something that many of our customers have spoke about in those info sessions, the community feedback sessions. Um, we are really thrilled to um, be at this point right now, ready to build our first library in almost two decades. And I wanna thank each of you um, who've helped us get across that line. We really appreciate it. And we're excited to build a world-class facility for the Park Heights community. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we're checking online to see if there's any one that wish to testify online, and I see no green buttons. So, is there a motion to move the bill favorable? So moved. Second. So moved by Glover and seconded by Ramos, Chair Middleton. An astounding yes. <laughs> Bullock? Yes. Yes. Conway? Yes. Yes. Dorsey? Is a yes. Glover? Yes. Is a yes. Ramos? Yes. Is a yes. And Stokes? Yes. Is a yes. This bill will move to second reader. Thank you all for that one. Okay, next, bill number... 24-0514, zoning conditional use conversion, a single family dwelling units to two dwelling units in the R7 zoning district variances, 3040 Barclay Street. For the purpose of permitting subject to certain condition, conditions, the conversion of certain single family dwelling units to two dwelling units in the R7 zoning district on the property known as 3040 Barclay Street Block 357A8, lot 033, as outlined in red on the accompanying plat, granting variances from certain bulk uh, regulations, lot area size, and off-street parking requirements, and providing for a special effective date. This bill was introduced on April 8th, 2024. Sponsor, Council Member Ramos. Um, any added comments on this bill? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and colleagues. Um, this is a very tight-knit neighborhood. Um, I had asked the owner to uh, please make sure that there was a lot of approval from the neighbors as well as the community association, which they did get. Um, the owners are here. If there's any questions uh, from my colleagues, there is an amendment from the law department that I'm accepting as friendly, uh, just as a way to clarify the variances that are needed for this. Um, and um, I um, hope for your favorable report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I also want to recognize um, Councilwoman Porter is also to my right, which is sponsor of a bill we're going to be hearing. Thank you, uh, Any committee members have any questions on this bill at this point? We will now be checked to see if there's... Oh, look, I'm skipping the agency reports, trying to get this moving. Mm -hmm. City solicitor... Thank you, Madam Chair. Michelle Toth on behalf of the Law Department. And um, we have an amendment to add a variance for gross floor area for the lower level unit. Thank you. Okay. Um, and that should be in your packet. Uh, housing Community Development. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jason Wright representing DHCD. We respectfully stand behind our favorable bill report. Thank you. Planning Commission. Uh, good afternoon. This bill was reviewed by the Planning Commission in their meeting of May 10th, uh, where they offered a favorable um, recommendation for this conversion. Just a little bit by way of background, uh, this property had historically had what amounts to an in-law suite, not necessarily a formal separate unit, but was kind of developed along that line. So uh, this approval would codify that as a separate formal unit. Um, some of the variances that you'll see in the bill uh, are for the lot area for the second dwelling unit. So normally 2,200 square feet of property area would be required and this lot only has 1,406. So that's about a 36% uh, lot area variance. You've already heard about the one for the uh, gross square floor area for uh, one of the units as well to meet that requirement in the conditional use conversion standards for the size of units. Um, as far as the uh, findings for 
um, the conditional use, um, the Planning Commission didn't see where there'd be any negative externalities created by this additional unit functionally as an in-law suite. It's kind of already been there uh, already. Um, it wouldn't be uh, precluded by any other particular law uh, or, or requirement. And so uh, they found uh, that it was approvable and recommended favorable. Thank you, BMZA. Madam Chair, the uh, BMZA defers to the Planning Commission. Thank you, BDC. Madam Chair, BDC stands by its report favorable. Thank you. Thank you. Transportation. Thank you, Madam Chair. We send our bill report of no objection. Thank you. And the, the Parking Authority for this one. Nicole Caesar from the Baltimore City Parking Authority. We stand behind our favorable bill report. Thank you. Could you repeat that, please, a little louder? Legal Caesar for the Parking Authority of Baltimore City. We stand behind our favorable bill report. Thank you. Fire Department. The Fire Department has no opposition to the bill, but they want me to emphasize that it doesn't negate any requirements for submission of plans to the Office of the Fire Marshal for review of construction. Thank you. Do committee members have any questions or comments? We'll now move to um, testimony. Do we have any public? Okay. We have no sign-ups and there's no one online as well. So is there a motion to move the amendment from the law department? So moved. So moved um, by Ramos, second by Glover. And is there a motion to move the bill favorable as amended? So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Bullock, uh, second by Ramos. Chair Middleton is a yes. Bullock yes. is a yes. Conway yes. is a yes. Dorsey yes. is a yes. Glover yes. is a yes. Ramos yes. is a yes. And Stokes yes. is a yes. This bill will move to second reader. And then we're going to also move to another conditional use next, which is bill number 240486. And that's the zoning conditional use banquet hall variances, 601 Cherry Hill Road. For the purpose of permitting Subject to certain conditions, the establishment, maintenance, and operation of a banquet hall in the property known as 601 Cherry Hill Road, Block 7625, Lot 046, as outlined in red on the accompanying plat, granting a variance from off-street parking requirements and providing for a special date. This bill was introduced on January 29th, 2024, and the bill sponsor is Councilmember Porter and comments from the sponsor. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so just want to ground everyone in this con uh, conditional zoning variance change. Um, this particular operator went through an extensive process of community engagement, working with the community-based organizations in the area and my office um, for this particular zoning change. Um, he has the support not only from two organizations in Cherry Hill, but he also has a letter of support from my office. Uh, and I wholeheartedly um, hope my colleagues can support this bill. Thank you. Um, are there any, do the committee have any questions on this particular bill? Let's go to the agency reports, city solicitor. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Elena DePietro from the city solicitor's office. Um, the, the law department can approve the bill for form and legal sufficiency, provided that all the procedural um, obligations are met and the council makes appropriate findings. Thank you. Fire department. Uh, Madam Chair, same as same thing as the last bill. Um, the fire department uh, takes no position on the bill, but wants to emphasize that it may require the submission of plans to the Office of the Fire Marshal for review of construction, fire detection, notification, suppression, and automatic sprinkler installation, and may be subject to an annual fire inspection. Thank you. Housing. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Jason Wright representing DHCD. We respectfully stand behind our favorable bill report. Planning Commission. 
Uh, good afternoon again. This was reviewed by the Planning Commission, their public meeting on March 28th. Um, and in the description of the use, the applicant was asking for a banquet hall, which might be, uh, it sounds maybe more than what they actually need. They just have a couple things going on there. They're helping some seniors there. It's, and also um, having like a barbershop for youth uh, training after school hours. And they want to be able to allow people to use the space to help provide some income to support those beneficial things. So it, it's probably on the borderline of being a, a community center more than anything else. However, if you use certain magic words at the zoning counter, um, they, they want to make sure that that's included, which is fine. So this will cover them so that they don't have any problems uh, going forward. So it was presented to the Planning Commission. Uh, they didn't find there would be any negative impacts from this particular use here. There's no impacts with uh, area plans. In fact, it actually uh, supports the general uh, Cherry Hill transfer transformation plan that was adopted uh, back in 2019 and a couple other adjacent uh, community plans. So uh, we think it meets the required findings for conditional use uh, and so we recommend favorable. Thank you and the BMZ8 I know defers to the planning commission so and they just spoke. Uh, BDC? Madam Chair, Dave Garza for BDC. We stand by our report favorable. Thank you. Thank you. Transportation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Luciano Diaz, DOT. We send by a bill report of no objection. Thank you. And lastly, the Parking Authority. Thank you, Madam Chair. Christmas Age Parking Authority. We stand by our bill report, which was respectfully favorable. Thank you. Committee members have any comments or questions to the sponsor or the agencies? Hearing none, we're checking to see if there's any in person, there is none, or online, and we see no online wishes. So we'll now take a vote. Is there a motion to move the bill? So, so moved by Glover, second by Bullock. Chair Middleton, yes. Bullock yes. is a yes. Conway yes. is a yes. Dorsey yes. is a yes. Glover is a yes. Ramos yes. is a yes. Stokes yes. is a yes. This bill will move to second reader at the next council meeting. And now um, we save for last. Bill number 23-0435 zoning code modifications for the purpose of amending provisions of the Baltimore City zoning code relating to variances to conform to relevant state law making modifications to the process of granting variances clarifying provisions of the zoning code relating to non-conforming structures providing for special effective date and generally relating to the zoning and land use laws of baltimore city this bill was previously heard on march 19th 2024 the sponsor of the bill is council member Slifer. Uh, at the hearing, several amendments were adopted by the committee to the bill. These amendments, um, of course, can be found in the reprint included in the committee fi bill file. There are also additional amendments um, proposed. Okay, I don't have to. Okay. Um, Okay. So what I what I'm going to propose now, we have the sponsor of the bill here, Councilman Slifer. We um, were set up for a voting session. Um, but uh, before I um, allow you to talk about the bill, and I know that you have been um, working hard to get this bill moved for a voting session, um, we've had one hearing since the last hearing, and it's been basically some time. And over that time, um, I 
have been getting, uh, first of all, you know, I'm kind of speaking personally as chair of the committee and some of the um, issues that seem to still be not clarified. And I'm going to try, I'm going to ask for another hearing. And I say that because as I look at this bill and as we kind of move forward, you know, we're very, as council members of each of our prospective districts, we have different kinds of communities and neighborhoods. And um, variances have always been a touchy subject. And I try to look at long-term goals and um, neighborhood concerns and changes that could possibly take place down the road. Um, how is this real going to impact all of our communities down the road? And I've talked to, I, I have some opposition letters in from some of my communities that are going through a, a lot of different changes because of present variances. Um, talked to uh, some of the agencies and still um, as some of the letters that have come that are in from my community still have um, you know, concerns. And I really uh, think there's a need for another hearing. I want you to speak, but I know that some of the concerns have also come from, you know, some of the members of, uh, or I should say all of the members, members of the committee have, you know, shared some of their concerns and just really want to, we feel that there needs to be another hearing before we make a final decision and have a voting session. So I know this is taking time, but as a person that has experienced that long-term five-year changes that we had, the handbook and things that we had to work through, it, making rash, quick decisions on things like this can, as I said, can have some long-term effects. I know that one of the conversations was changing that 10% and shoring up the 21% and maybe some other amendments, but I'll stop there and um, let you comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for uh, scheduling this hearing. Uh, just to give a, a brief overview and, and just some of the timeline, um, this bill was introduced, I believe, nine months ago. Prior to that, I had uh, introduced a previous bill. Um, this bill was is an administration bill. It was drafted by the administration. It was drafted by Deputy Mayor Williams, which I want to thank him for his extensive research and working with me on that. And um, and all the meetings uh, that have been had with, with the relevant agencies to make sure that um, it fits in uh, to address the issue at hand, uh, but also uh, is a bill that works um, and fixes the, uh, the consequences that we're currently uh, facing. Um, the issue at hand here is that without, no without notice, the BMZA uh, decided to change the way that they had done business for decades. Um, the outcome of that decision was that uh, homeowners uh, who wanted to improve their property, wanted to expand their property for a variety of reasons in my district, examples I had given and uh, prompted this bill. I had disabled members in my district who uh, simply couldn't do the steps anymore, uh, needed to be able to uh, build an addition onto the ground level because the bedrooms were upstairs, uh, and other uh, constituents who wanted to allow their senior uh, parents or and relatives to move in with them um, didn't have uh, the space to do so and wanted to be able to stay uh, in this city. Um, and so uh, they were just simply uh, being denied the exact same variances that neighbors had been approved just a month prior. Uh, and so there was folks who have uh, purchased homes in the city, 
uh, with the exact idea of following suit and what multiple other people did with the exact same type of houses on their block. And they're no longer allowed to, uh, to do those exact same projects. Uh, and so the, the consequence of that is uh, the alternative has been that you could do a rezoning. Rezoning is a very timely and costly process. Uh, we're doing that in some circumstances, but uh, many, many people cannot afford to do that. Um, the other thing is uh, this really impacts uh, specific neighborhoods. It does not impact neighborhoods that have very large properties and large homes. They have the space and the ability to build with simply getting building permits. They don't need variances to, to do certain projects. Another issue that I had faced here was on a property that the house was out of compliance because it's a 70 year old house and the zoning code has changed over time. And therefore to do any modifications to the house, they had to bring it up to today's standard, which was not physically possible because the house was, was out of compliance already. And so um, that's where uh, this bill was born. Um, there was a lot of questions that were raised in the previous hearing. We, um, I've been wide open to any amendments. Uh, the, the primary concern that we had heard from communities and others uh, in response to somebody who sent out um, a misleading email to community associations was that uh, this was going to um, change uh, certain things that it wasn't gonna change, but nonetheless, we uh, indulged uh, that conversation and have made amendments to change the posting time from uh, for minor variances to increase it to the same time as, as major variances. So giving uh, the communities more time to organize. Uh, in addition, uh, this bill, in my opinion, gives the community more uh, say over what happens in their communities simply because uh, in the past, if the community association, I have a project that uh, happened in my neighborhood where uh, the community association and some of the neighbors were looking some, for some concessions uh, from the person who needed a variance. Um, they were unwilling to do so. Previously, they went to the BMZA and they got their approval. And um, what this bill would do is uh, streamline the process where you have uh, support uh, from the neighbors, from the associations, from, um, from folks, and it would streamline the process, which uh, would help more people be able to do more projects. And what that looks like in the city uh, is, is when somebody goes ahead and takes a home that is older, um, oftentimes I'm seeing in my districts, people take a rancher that often are assessed in the neighborhood of two to $300,000 in value uh, they take the roof off of the rancher, they build a, a second story on top, they put a few hundred thousand dollars into that property. It's the same family living in the same home, uh, but now the city, uh, reassess the, the property gets reassessed uh, for a lot larger amount. Oftentimes I've seen assessments that range uh, from four to six hundred thousand dollars above uh, what the previous assessment is. When, when the city reassesses these properties for four hundred thousand dollars more, the net result is that uh, we have an additional $8,000 a year in tax revenue to spend. And so we have an issue right now in the city um, with uh, capacity of, of not having enough money to do everything that we need to do. And this is a simple way to bring in more revenue um, and to address a lot of those issues. Um, and if we don't give people even a path where it's just physically not possible to build uh, an addition onto their home to modify their property, they, they often move. And um, that's what I'm seeing in my district. I've seen people whose uh, variances have failed and they put their house up, they move to the county and their income tax no longer uh, comes to the city. So we are losing a lot of money uh, because of this. Um, and I do believe that uh, this is a good bill. I think um, uh, Justin did a, a tremendous job at you know, dealing with all the nuance of it. And, um, and as the bill sponsor, I've been wide open to, to amendments. I've, since the last hearing, have reached out to, uh, to my colleagues, have offered the opportunity. If there's any issues they see, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, submit amendments and, and address those things. I think we've accomplished um, most, of, most of that um, in the amendments that have passed. And, and I think there's some more amendments on on the committee members' desks. And so I'm wide open to that. Um, when I read through the letters from community groups, what I find is that 
Uh, there's a lot of um, confusion just about what the bill actually does. Whenever you talk about zoning, it becomes a very hot topic. And so that's why I thank uh, the council members that came before us for handling all the comprehensive rezoning before we came into office, because that was a tremendous amount of uh, a work, a lot of community engagement, a lot of confusion around that. Um, and so I understand that and certainly happy to answer any questions as it pertains to this bill. But uh, most importantly, uh, any outstanding issues that, that are there, um, I am wide open and, and willing to fix. But uh, what, what I do want is that we find a way to uh, not let uh, this, this sudden uh, change uh, in how the BMZA does business cost the city um, residents and, and taxpayer dollars. So thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, are there, uh, I know the law department had amendments. What were any of those amendments about restricting use to restricted use for owner occupied for a residential use with a like a letter of intent, a letter, letter of intent where the owner has to be has to live in this property? There was a law department, um, let me find it, amendment. And as you're looking up that, I'll just speak. This is kind of like an exa example of how, you know, we, <coughs> We don't want to make these kind of decisions um, quickly. It takes, it's, it, you know, this is something that's going to affect um, the entire city. And that's, we're just trying to be as careful as, as possible. And um, I see a hand up of committee member John Bullock. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate you giving the opportunity. And then, um, Councilmember Schleifer is a bill sponsor. Quick questions, because I think it's important for us to talk about, you mentioned, um, Vice President, um, the difference in some of our communities. So this may not be an issue that I've dealt with, but I'm curious for the, for the sponsor, Councilman, um, is there a set of circumstances or particular instance that you're looking to address? Because I know I've, I haven't dealt with it, but I know in your district you may have. Can you explain what that looks like? Sure, thank you for that question, uh, Councilman. Uh, and, and to uh, the, chair's, the chair's point, these decisions should not be made uh, quickly, uh, but the reason why we're here is because that is what the BMZA did. They made a quick decision to change the way uh, the BMZA operated for, for decades. And so uh, the circumstance here that we're looking to, to address is, is really to give the BMZA the ability to do what the board is set out to do. So the board is supposed to be able to look at a situation, have discretion and make a decision accordingly. Uh, unfortunately, what, what this uh, new decision uh, has done is prevented them from, from doing so. And so uh, primarily the issue that I'm seeing in my district, and I, I've heard from some of our colleagues that they have similar uh, issues, and I've reviewed some of the list of, of variances that have been denied. Uh, so it is an issue that does that does span um, in many different districts, but it's particularly in um, areas where you have smaller homes, and so you have smaller lots, uh, and so that's primarily where I'm seeing the issue. I see the issue a lot uh, in in neighborhoods uh, like the one I grew up in in Falstaff, right down the block from the plaza, where we have semi-detached houses. Everybody's lot is essentially the same. They're small lots, uh, but uh, in order to raise your family there or to allow an elderly relative to move in with you, oftentimes you have to close and close your porch. Uh, if you drive down the block I grew up in in the neighborhood I did, you'll see uh, plenty of that, which unfortunately can no longer happen, uh, but uh, that, that's been done. And so it's, it's really primarily happening in, um, in areas where there's smaller properties and smaller lots, because like I'd mentioned in my introduction, you know, when you go into neighborhoods that have larger homes and larger lots, uh, these kind of uh, issues are not really 
coming up too often because you have a large lot. So, you know, in order to build to build something or to do something to your house, you really need a building permit. You're not necessarily encroaching um, closer to a property line where you would require like a setback or 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 that kind of variance. So thank you for the answer and thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chair. Thank you. And do you have a comment, Councilwoman? Okay. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the um, bill sponsor. Uh huh. Yep. Um, and I did see that in some of the uh, amendments there were uh, changes to the um, the notice requirements. So the 10 days to the 21. So I appreciated that. Um, and also the um, keeping of the 10% for major and minor variances and not 25%. So I appreciate that you changed that as well. Um, I just had, I'll just stick to two questions right now. Um, this might be a question for the law department. Um, I'm looking at page two of the reprint. We are uh, taking out um, in writing under, um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the amendment in front of me, but one of the amendments is to take out the words in writing, which were added to the, um, the bill. And then in, um, Section two, uh, sub two, it says a person, so I'll just read it all. An application for a variance conditional use permit or zoning appeal must be filed. And then we're taking out in writing by the it, one, the owner of a property to which the application applies um, or a person expressly authorized by the owner in writing. So we're taking out that in writing, um, but then uh, under three is the same sentence and in writing is back in. So I'm trying to understand if we're, what, what I understood the question was about this word in writing was that the, um, we don't always wanna say in writing because we may use electronic at some point, right? Well, that's fine. But then number two and number three here are about the person who represents the owner there needs to be some verification that they are there. We just, I just want to make sure that this is consistent. Right now it's inconsistent. You see what I'm saying? Comments? <laughs> uh, my amendment was only that the first in writing be stricken. Um, and that was, I, I believe you're correct because this could be an electronic process. Um, I don't think that I put in the second removal. Of it was in the original bill. So the original bill has the first section two in writing taken out, but the third one is stay, staying in. So it just may be an oversight in the bill. Would you characterize that as such? I, I mean, I can't speak to the specific of that of that amendment. That was not uh, that was not mine. Um, I see Justin disappeared, so if he if he up. reappears, uh, he can he can speak to that. If I can uh, try and help, so um, yeah, on that page, the in writing that is inserted in line nine and deleted from line eleven. I think the goal of that was just to move it to the the parent paragraph so that it equally applies to the owner of the property or to that. Uh, person expressly authorized just by way of clarification. Uh, so my comment was uh, if you delete the added in writing from line nine, then you should remove the, the brackets from the bill as written in line 11 to keep it at least there. The net result would be these lines would stay the same as they are in today's code. So you can either move it up to not, uh, line 14 was, was not, touched in one way or the other. I think in a, in a similar way, moving it up to line 12 would make sense to my reading, but I'm a planner, not an attorney. Um, but I would say if you delete the in writing from line nine, you should remove the brackets from line 11 to leave it as it is in today's code. Or if you move it, then it can be deleted from uh, line 11. Uh, one of those two would make sense. If you delete it from nine and the brackets stay. I see what you're trying to say, harder. but it's two separate things. It's two separate things. Yeah. Councilwoman, yeah. can you send the question? Since I will. I'll be. I'm, I'm just. Thank you. I'm, I was yeah, told I to only limited to one or two questions, yes. so I will follow up because we, we do have the opportunity to follow and up. And it's Thank just you. showing 
that, you know, there still needs to be clarity on a number of things. And I'm also offering an amendment for something restricted to owner occupied for residential use as well. And I also know that um, planning is also working on uh, some uh, the comprehensive zoning code down the road. Did you, did you want to speak, add to that? Sure. Uh, so since the 2017 enactment of the brand new overhauled zoning code, we made a, a commitment to try at least yearly to make amendments to the code with lived experience. Um, I have a seven page running document of all the things that uh, I have come across and thank you to the sponsor for uh, allowing me to insert some of the non-controversial cleanups at the tail end of this bill. Should it move through, that would be very helpful to us. Uh, if not, I'm anticipating in the new session needing an administration bill for the the things that maybe didn't make it through not trying to delay this particular bill. Uh, so we're going to be back before you with another zoning modification bill in the new session anyway. Uh, but I would love to see some of our amendments uh, ride the coattails of this one if possible. Thank you for your comments. And um, Councilman Glover, I saw you have a comment. I'm sorry, thanks. Um, could you explain to us, like, is it um, appropriate or if we was to pass something like this, um, would we be able to do it by like jurisdictions, by council districts? Do this have to be a citywide like bill? It couldn't be like per council district and we make the decision by sending things or zoning for the variance of properties and things of that nature? I'm not 100% positive without looking, but my impression is that the zoning would have to apply citywide. Yeah. So, you know, Jason, Council, you Councilman have, Glover, you? you're just showing me uh, as the chair, you know, we we feeling these questions of who ben who's going to benefit down the road, how it's our... We have so many diverse individual neighborhoods within each of our districts that, you know, it raises concerns to make a blown out decision of, you know, like this. I know, Councilman Slifer, that you are, you know, working hard within your district. Um, you want to respond? Yeah, and so, yeah, so to answer your question, I mean, Variance has come in, and Eric can speak to this from all across the city. And so, this is simply bringing things back towards the way that it's operated uh, for many decades. So, whoever's benefited over the past 40 plus years are the same people there. And as far as like, um, you know, who does it benefit? It benefits anybody who needs to modify the property, and so who it who it harms. Uh, is anybody in any family that, that either gets too large or wants to allow family members to move in, they don't have the capacity. So it really, th this, this, the way things are currently operating, the decision that was made overnight by the BMZA is harming smaller homes across the city. And so um, that's, that's really, I think, the point to, to look at is we're not trying to change things from the way things have always, have always been. We're, we're trying to adapt uh, in code, giving the BMZA the discretion to make decisions that they already have been making for all this time. It's by no means does this bill automatically mean that, you know, anything's going to be approved. And I like the idea of owner occupied. I think that that was certainly something we've discussed in the intention. Um, and, you know, my understanding is that um, that that's from at least in my, my constituency, that's who I get all of these requests from is people who are trying to uh, stay in the city or, or modify their property. Um, and so, and I believe it, it's, it's, um, you know, that's, that's where I came to, to introduce in this bill. Um, so I think it benefits people from all across the city who want to, um, uh, modify and improve their property. I know we, we desperately want people to invest in their properties, uh, to strengthen the neighborhoods. And so that's, that's what this bill does. It gives the BMZA the ability to look at a circumstance in an average house in the city and say, yes or no, whereas right now without this bill, uh, the answer is no, unless it fits a very unique criteria, which most homes in the city do not meet. 
so uh, Glover, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, another question is uh, to the sponsor of the bill. Uh, would this also uh, pertain to like businesses, like group homes that are like in our community that uh, that want to expand their homes to allow you know others to come in to more occupancy, you know, to come into those those properties because it is it is a business. Um, can you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah. So when. So I, this is not this is not uh, set out to address things in the business community, um, and so uh, that's my interpretation, and that was my uh, request when uh, meeting about drafting this bill is that it pertains to uh, to residences and not to businesses, and so um, if the law department uh, feels that that's not clear enough, I am wide open to any amendment to clarify that, but I. I think that's what they had said before, but if not, we're certainly happy to, to clarify that if the law department feels that there's something that could be added to, to clarify that. And one, one other thing, uh, and one other thing is, uh, like uh, in my thoughts over at Little Eagle Park is a very diverse community that come in from like all over the country to move into the community, but I do know that there are some New Yorkers that have come to the community and uh, basically was speaking about how they wanted to expand their property. And then I have other community members are, you know, in rage to say, no, this is, this is historical. This is what we do here and this is how we want to keep it. And, and I'm just wondering if there's, you know, some place, some community in New York where it has gotten to a point where this has happened and now we see the influx of residents coming from New York to Baltimore and I'm wondering if we will have the same effect like some of them are having in New York where they have no place to go because of them expanding their properties and if they was to come here and expand their properties are we losing residents as opposed to uh, gaining because of the space if that makes sense. So definitely understand what you're saying, and I'm hoping that the agencies are taking note in some of these questions so we can kind of get clarity. And we'll, and um, Councilman Bullock has, also uh, has no, Councilman no, Bullock first. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe this will help provide some clarity. I appreciate you know your point and Councilman Glover's point, and this might be helpful in terms of Councilman Slifer. So, one of the challenges that I know my, my district has dealt with, I can think about a place like Harlem Park, but there are others where we have residential care facilities that pop up in neighborhoods. And so oh, one of the challenges yes. you have is that, and if this connects to what you're saying in terms of the owner occupied, and I get that you're looking for this to be owner occupied, because the challenge could be, I could see a scenario where someone purchases a property, they do these you know, um, renovations, expansion, get a variance, and then the ownership could change and someone else could do something. So, so I get some of the concern, maybe that's, that's being expressed in terms of the usage of the property, even with that type of um, variance as provided. So I think that that's for some of the clarity, just hearing this. Yeah, and if, uh, I mean, I, I definitely could use a little bit of clarity. I'm not really sure what you mean by people coming from New York and expanding properties. I mean, New York, I don't know if we're talking about New York City, New York State. I mean, New York's a very large place. Um, I'm sure you I, just. I'm not sure. I would just use it. No, I would just use it for an example because it was it was just an individual example, that came in. Yeah, just an example. That yeah. people, you're saying people who live in New York want to move to Baltimore? No, what I was saying is that the, the conversation that I had with a New Yorker that that wanted to come to Baltimore was thinking about buying property in Baltimore. We already have some from like New Jersey, Delaware. They're, they're here. They're in Little Eagle Park. Um, but what I'm saying is that some of them have mentioned how they want to expand and widen their space because to them, you know, that space is just, you know, kind of too small, you know, and, and um, I, I'm just asking, is your bill um, a bill where, you know, they are can you, expand Are you, are you, are you talking space. about people, invest, are you talking about investors? Or are you talking about, I'm just talking about folks that want to buy properties, period. You know? Are you talking about resident, like people who want to live here and raise their family here? Are you talking about investments? Both. I mean, well, I mean, so I'm going to stop it right here because what it's basically showing me is that 
the committee is not prepared to take on a vote. We want to, um, we want to have another hearing. So I'm going to um, call a recess and defer to another for us to have um, schedule another hearing. Um, we need to really go over uh, these added amendments um, to see if they are answering the questions of the, the, some of the questions that we're getting. Um, I th I'm feeling if we do take a vote, it, it, it there's just we're just not ready. And I can feel if if a if a committee member um, does not agree with how we're the temperature that we're feeling and the kind of questions that we're not getting answers for, we we just really think we need another hearing. And I'll let you make the final comment, and then we'll recess. Sure. I mean, yeah, if it's the will of of the committee, uh, the chairperson to. Uh, to have another hearing, that's that's fine. I mean, I was I was told this would be that other hearing that was requested, but that that's fine. I I'm happy to have further conversations. I think I'll close out with just that. Um, if people want to move to Baltimore um, and invest in their property here, I don't care where they come from. Um, if they want to raise their family here, I want them here. Uh, if they want to, um, you know live here, work here, and um, help contribute to our tax base. Uh, I'm very excited to have them, even if they're from New York. Uh, and what I would just say is that the number one issue, uh, financial issue that we have as a city um, is our population. Um, and the fact is, is that the city has the capacity for a million people and we have less than 600,000. And so we should be doing anything we can to encourage more people uh, to come and live in Baltimore and invest in Baltimore. And if we do that, uh, then we will immediately have the capacity and the funds that we need to be able to do all uh, the wonderful things that, that we want to continue doing in the city. Uh, and so I just want to just make that point and also say that, you know, if, if there is an amendment from any member of the committee, I am wide open. Uh, to any amendment. I've always been that way on, on my bills. I want to work collaboratively. I don't dig my feet in as, you know, as long as the, the bill writer, Justin Williams, is fine with the amendment, I'm fine with it too. Uh, and I would just say that uh, if you can bring that to me and, um, and to the law department, if you can provide anything that it would take to uh, just clarify that uh, the intention here is for owner occupied, that would be great. Um, and I look forward uh, to this bill passing at a future hearing and us getting an influx of people who want to move into Baltimore City, invest in their properties and further our tax base. So when we have those budget hearings uh, for two weeks of the year that we have extra money to spend and invest in a lot of things that we need to do as a city. So uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Thank you. And just for clarity, this was set up for a voting session, not for another hearing. So now we, um, it's been clarified that we want to have another hearing because I, I, listening to the questions that um, we still need answers to individually and as a whole, because we don't wanna make mistakes that um, have been made in the past and we definitely want to move forward with our city. So at this time, we're going in recess to um, talk about more amendments and then reschedule for a, another hearing on this bill. Thank you.